again good uh, afternoon everyone um i uh, i wish you uh, all got a, a great weekend so uh, let's go straight back to our subject matters in the in the middle of our class today i will pause and talk about our midterm results right but uh, first i would like to go back to our subject matters first all right so before the midterm, we talk about the topic of Six Sigma, right? I would like to wrap it up uh, a little bit and then we move on to the new topic. Okay, so we are still in module four, module five, I'm sorry. Module five is a long module. There's so many topics in it. So module five is about, uh, Again, quality management. Um, and last time we talked about the the topic of six sigma, right? So I, I would like to wrap it up. I would like to add a little bit more and then we wrap it up. All right, so last time we talked about the sigma level. Um, and uh, let me remind you, the sigma level is calculated as norm dot as dot inverse uh, one minus the dBU plus with one point plus with one point five. Okay. So in this um, in this definition of the sigma level. It doesn't require any specific features of the process of the industry or anything of the company, anything. It just asks for one thing, the defect probability. So if we measure the unit job or we count the number of, um, of service points, right? Uh, and we count how many errors it is, we calculate the percentage of errors or the defect probability. We just plug it here in this equation, and then we can find the sigma level of the process, right? So this this definition of the sigma level is very general, uh, which means that it can be applied to many things that we see in real life, right? So uh, last time we talked about the sigma level for processes. The processes can either be manufacturing or it can be services. It doesn't matter as long as we have the percentage of errors or the probability of defects, right? We just plug it in and we, we can find it, sigma level. So it doesn't matter uh, what the process is. But today I also like to say one more thing that this sigma level can be applied to workers too. Right. For example, if you are an accountant, in one year you have to calculate one million numbers, and out of one million numbers, if you only make three point four errors, and think about it, you are working at the six sigma level, and if you can put that little lie in your CV, saying that you are working at the six sigma level, then companies will seek you out and, and give you a very good job, very high salaries exceptionally high salaries, right? To, to, to keep you, to retain you. Otherwise you will go to another company who is even uh, more eager, who is even more eager to, to get you them, right? Or if you are uh, in the IT industry, out of 1 million lines of code that you write down in the software, you only had 3.4 errors out of 1 million lines of code, right? then actually you are working at the Six Sigma level right there. And if you can put that lie into your CV, saying that you are working at the Six Sigma level, then people will interview you right away, and then they will give you a, a good job right away, okay? Uh, of course, you have to pass the interview, everything. But then you're gonna have a very successful career with, with that high performance level, right? For me, 
I, I'm not at the Six Sigma level yet, but every semester I work on it. Okay, uh, my goal is near zero defects or zero errors, meaning that all of the numbers that I put in the homework, the exams, the project things like that, right? I always try so that they are correct because if they are not correct, I will have to fix it. It's very costly to fix, especially during the exams, right? We have to, uh, and especially it is an online exam like this, how, how can I fix it? It's really hard. So, um, so that's why every semester I work on it. I try to check, I try to develop uh, some kind of new methods so that, or develop, develop methods over time so that I can check my work. I can get a minimize the number of errors or typos that I have. Okay, so um, I'm not there yet, but at least that's my goal, right? My goal is near zero defects. Uh, so I, I, I work on that every day. I work on that every semester on, on each of the items that I give you, right? So I would like to encourage everybody to also have that kind of mindset. You look around your work, your life, try to minimize the number of errors. You climb up the Sigma level over time, uh, the Sigma ladder over time, so that one day you're gonna get to the 6.0, right? You will have a very successful career. You will have a high salary, uh, things like that. So that's good for all of us, right? Okay, so um, so I, I hope so. Everybody will, uh, uh, in the future, you, you would climb up your Sigma level the ladder of the sigma level. All right, so with that, I would like to close up this uh, Six Sigma topic. And today we move on to a new topic. Let me talk about the background things first and then uh, we're gonna work on a numerical example. All right, so um, we have, the next topic is uh, called Oh, before I work on the new topic, I would like to show you the one slide in our module five. Okay, so um, we talked about SPC earlier, but that's the overview. In that overview, uh, we talked uh, about the four main activities of SPC. The first activity is capability analysis. We want to see how much or to what extent our process can conform to the desired specification, right? So the capability here is a capability of meeting the desired specification. And then, um, okay, so we start with that. And then in, in daily production, right, we monitor the process to see if the process has any abnormality or not. If it is no, Abnormality, it means that the process is, is following our uh, our uh, intended uh, um, de desire, right? But from time to time, there, there are some abnormality. We call it as a special variation. And with a special variation, then uh, we need to investigate what happened. What are the cause? What are the causes of that special variation, right? So that we can fix it now. So the next step is we fix it now and in the future, we avoid the cause altogether by building a more robust process. So um, if we're with a more robust process, then we can kind of avoid all the problem that we might have, uh, right? So let's think about these uh, four main activities in SPC as one route, but it doesn't end there, right? Another we today we have that round. Tomorrow we have another round. Tomorrow the day after we have another round, right? So this is a never-ending loop of four minute activities. And after each round, our process is better than the previous one, right? So over time we build up and build up, uh, revise and, and and upgrade our process so that our process is much better over time. So that's a goal, right, in, uh, in SPC. All right, so uh, today we will talk about the first topic right here, about capability analysis. So let me uh, start that with you.
it is a never ending loop. And over time, our process becomes better and better because we work on that. We try to improve that over time. Where every week, every month, every year, we try to improve our process. All right, so um, this is a big topic of process capability. And this is a capability of meeting our desired specification. Okay, so, um, and this topic is mainly in the manufacturing context. Okay, so um, as a leading example, I would like to talk about our cell phone. Our cell phone is normally made of two big pieces, the base piece and the, the touch screen piece on the top, right? So let's call that as a base piece and a glass piece. Um, they have to fit each other. Otherwise, uh, we will not have a good product, right? So before we, we actually produce the uh, cell phones, we all have to come up with a design of, of how big the glass piece is, how big the base piece is, so that later on when we uh, bring them together from, from, from different vendors, for example, then they will fit with each other, right? So um, let's look at the design of the glass piece, the touch screen piece of the cell phone. It will look like this, right? Typically, so this is a glass piece of a cell phone. We design it to be this width and this length or height. And we, we want our uh, factories to, to cut the, the piece uh, the glass piece with this dimension, right? If it is too big, too wide, or too short, or uh, too narrow, or too long, they will be defective because you will not be able to put the glass piece on the base piece. So this is a, our desirable set of values. We, we desire it to be that way, okay? Um, and our um, the later analysis will focus on only one dimension. We focus on the length. And it doesn't matter much because the calculation for the width is the same. We, we follow the same equation, right? Uh, for a product, potentially there, may, there can be many, many dimensions. The width, the length, the thickness of the glass piece, the sensitivity of the sensors, and then all other characteristics uh, of the product, right? But all the calculation will follow the same uh, way. So we only need to focus on one dimension. And uh, the, that, that analysis can be applied to many other things. All right, so um, in manufacturing, there are two aspects. One is you design the product first. And second, you wouldn't manufacturing it uh, according to the design, right? So I would like to talk about the design specification first. So we want the glass piece to have that length all the time because uh, we think that that is the optimal and that's follow our design, right? But then in, manuf in manufacturing, to cut a piece of glass of the exact same length every time is really hard. Why so? Because all of the temperature, all the elements will alter the length of our cuts. Okay, so that's why uh, it's really hard to to achieve the same uh, the same length for all of the cuts. So the engineers think that we allow it to vary a little bit, and it doesn't matter much. Okay, 
uh, and the product is uh, still good. So we uh, draw the design specification as a range as a follow. Instead of only one value, now we specify a range for the products to vary in between, right? So let me, uh, okay, so the value on the left-hand side is called the lower spec limit. The value on the right-hand side is the upper spec limit, right? We allow the unit to, the length of the, of the glass piece to vary from the lower spec limit to the upper spec limit. And we deem that they are good. If a unit goes beyond the upper spec limit or goes below the lower spec limit, then we deem them as defective. So that's that's a range of acceptable value. Let's go. Let's think about it that way. And in the middle of that range, we can uh, find the design value or the desirable value. Right? We want the glass bead to hit that D all the time. But there's no way. So that's why we allow the glass pieces to vary to the left hand side, to the right hand side uh, a little bit. All right. So let me uh, uh, clarify the acronyms here. The LSL is uh, the lower specification limit. And the USL is an upper specification limit. Right? So we, we allow the units to vary between the lower and the upper spec limit. And they are they are still good. Oh we only deem them as defective if they go beyond they they pass these two limits. Um, and in the middle, we have the desirable points. Or desirable value. Or uh, a lot of the time we call that as a bullseye. Right? When you play a dot game, you try to hit the bullseye, right? Every shot you try to hit the bullseye. Can we hit the bullseye all the time? It's really hard. Sometimes we go to the left, sometimes we go to the right, a top or down, right? It's really hard to hit the same value every time. So that's why we allow some kind of a range of acceptable values in, in manufacturing. Uh, otherwise it's not feasible, right? Okay, so uh, in this case, actually we can calculate the, the bullseye. So if we know the LSL and the USL, then we can calculate the D to be uh, the USL plus the LSL divided by two. All right, then we can find the middle point in the range. So that's, that's basic uh, math, right? Okay, so that's the design specification. Before we produce anything, we uh, we come up with this range of acceptable values. And we want during the production process, uh, the process will generate or will uh, produce a units to be within that lower spec limit and the upper spec limit, right? Okay, so that's the design point of view. And here is um, the production point of view. We call that as a process variation because the process cannot stick with the desirable values every time, so it's going to vary, right? So we call it as process variation. By the way, how to measure the process variation? We measure 100 units, we measure 1,000 1, units, or even more, right? And then uh, with the measurement data, we can kind of look at them and, and analyze them to see how how much the process varies. So um, for our convenience, 
uh, calculation, we're going to assume that the cost has tend to follow the normal distribution. We assume that the, the cost has followed uh, the normal distribution. So, um, and you know what, that assumption is normally correct because in manufacturing, in economics and finance, a lot of things tend to follow the normal distribution. And after some time, people call that as a normal distribution because there's so many things that tend to follow that distribution, right? So the, or in other words, the normal distribution is the most popular uh, probability distribution because there's so many things in real life tend to follow that distribution. All right, so um, let's draw it up and see how uh, we can use a normal distribution to uh, characterize process variation. Okay, so here we talk about the length of the glass piece, right, it can be anywhere. Uh, but then really, we, after we measure up many units through the process or through the machine, we can calculate the mean and the standard deviation, right? So with those two parameters, we can draw the distribution as the following. Right? It is a symmetric bell-shaped curve where at the center, we have the, the average of the distribution or that, that is a mean or mu, mean or average are the same thing, right? So from the mean, um, and, and here's a special property of the norm, normal distribution. From the mean, oh, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention that there's also the, the standard deviation. Uh, the standard deviation is right here. The standard deviation is just a number that characterizes how variability the distribution uh, has, right? So we call it as a standard deviation or sigma. Um, if we go to the left hand side by three sigma and cut off the tails of this, and if we go to the right hand side by three sigma and cut off the tails by that, Then in the middle, how much do we have? Actually, we're gonna have more than 99.97% of the distribution left if we cut the, those two tails up. But 99.97% just means that we retain mainly uh, virtually the whole distribution left. So to characterize the whole distribution, we don't have to go all the way to the right hand side or go all the way to the left hand side. We only need to stop at these two points and then it's already captured nearly all the, the distribution. Or in this, uh, in, in this particular manufacturing context, this range from here to here will capture 99.97% of all of the glass pieces cut by the machine, for example, right? So nearly all of the units are captured by these range of, of six sigma. I say six sigma because we go here, three sigmas here and, and that three six sigma over there. And this six sigma has nothing to do with the six sigma that topic that we learned earlier, right? It's another, it's another definition. All right, so in this case, right, we go from the mean to the left-hand side by three sigma. So we would write this point now as mu minus three sigma. And on the right hand side, we go from the mean and we add with three sigma, right? So we'll go to the left by three, go to the right by three. And we call these as a lower variation limit and the upper variation limit, right? So let me uh, make a quick note here. So we have, LVL as the lower variation limit 
uh, UVL as the upper variation limit. All right, and the equation is right there. We take mu minus three sigmas, to have the LVL, and we go up by three sigma or mu plus three sigma to have the UVL. Okay, so um, so these two points are very special, right? Uh, one, the point right here and that point right here. But it doesn't mean that the units always stay inside these two points. Nearly all of them will stay inside. But from time to time, we might have some outliers overshooting the limits, right? So we might have a point or units or, or a glass piece with that length beyond that upper variation limit. So all of these are called outliers. Or on the left hand side, if you from time to time we're gonna observe some uh, units go be even below the lower variation of it, right? So we also call them as a outliers. Right? Because potentially there's something my specifically happen that make the units too long or too short, very far away from the mean of the distribution. All right, uh, let me go back to the sigma a little bit. So the sigma is called the standard deviation of the distribution. If the sigma is higher, then it means that the process has more variation, okay? Earlier we have this sigma, but now if the sigma is higher, then it means that the products now vary more than before. So we call it as more variation. But of course, we want to have smaller sigma because we want to have less variation than before. Less variation means that the units are more consistent with each other or among another. So, uh, and if they are more consistent, then we can control the process more easily. Right? If they are all over the place, then uh, it is hard to control the quality of the products, but if they are cling together uh, or they, they cling or they stay close together, then it's easier for us to, to adjust the process to hit the bullseye. On, on, on the average basis. Okay, so we have these as a characterization of the process variation, right? We measure up 100 units or even more than that, 1,000 or even more. Then we calculate the mean, the standard deviation. And then we know that it will go to the left hand side by three sigma to the right hand side, also by three sigma. Then we capture nearly all of the units produced through the machine or through the through the process. Right. We, we talk about the manufacturing context by cutting the glass piece uh, for the cell phone. So 99.97 of all of the glass pieces will be between that uh, LVL and the UVL. Right. Okay, so now we already talk about the design specification. And we just talk about the process variation, right? Now we need to compare the two and see how much, to what extent we comply with the uh, design specification. So next, we want to compare between the design specification and the uh, process variation. Um, for the intuition of the comparison, we would like to do this with the visual sketch first. And then later on, we're gonna calculate some indexes uh, compared between these two things. So what we're doing next is the following. Uh, first of all, we draw the two scale diagram.
one for the design specification, the other for the process variation. So um, on the top, we, we're going to draw the specification first. And then, uh, so we uh, talked about this earlier, right? So we just draw the LSL, USL, and the bullseye. We want the product to hit the D point all the time, but of course, there's no way. So we allow the units to vary between the LSL and the USL. Okay, landing outside this wind should be, uh, means that the unit is defective. So that's the first scale. The second scale is right beneath the first scale. And this is for the process variation. We don't know uh, where things are yet, so we just draw a line like that. And then uh, we write down the value of the mean, right? And then we go to the left hand side by, for example, three sigma. So that's a LVL right here. And go to the right hand side by also three sigma. So that's a UVL right there. Remember, beyond these UVL and LVL, we still have other units. They are the they are the outliers. Right? They are rare, but from time to time they do happen. Okay, so uh, by looking at this uh, picture, right, we can compare between what the process is doing relative to what we wanted it to do, right? So this picture, if you look at it, it is bad. Why so? Because, first of all, on average, we do not meet the bullseye. To meet the bullseye, the mu has to be exactly under the D, right? But here we, we see some shift in the mu relative to the D. So we say that on average, we do not meet the bullseye. And second, the LVL stick out of the LSL, right? The LVL is supposed to be inside here, for example, here. Then it means that nearly all of the products will meet the lower spec limit. But this, this time, in this particular sketch, this LVL is below that LSL. So uh, not all of the products will stay inside the lower spec limit. Right? Some of them will, will go passing that lower spec limit. And it means that they are defective. On the right side, if you look at the picture, right, this UVL is way beyond the USL. So we're going to see a lot of units defective because they are too big or too uh, long if we talk about the glass piece in the cell phone, right? Okay, so in this case, right, if you uh, uh, if you want to show the number of defectives or, or the range of defectives, you can uh, project the lower spec limit down right here, project the USL down right here, right? Then all of these are defective. The whole range right here are defective. And then on the right hand side, right, go beyond the USL are uh, all defective. So we we imagine that we have a lot of defective units in this case. Of course, we we do not have the specific uh, numbers here to, to show, but just imagine that because the lower variation limit and the UVL. The upper variation limit, right, sticks out too way out of the design specification. So we would have a lot of defective units. Right, so that's what the, the picture can tell. But in engineers, people need to be precise, right? What do you mean by that? We have to calculate a number to, to measure how good we stay with the design specification. So when you read the textbook, they talk about the CP process capability. It is a number the, that, that reflects how good, upon how good we are with the design specification, right? Uh, but that CP assumes that the mu and the D are aligned. Or in other words, we, uh, for that CP, 
um, in the textbook that you read, we, we normally assume that the process is centered. The process is centered, meaning that the mu equals the d, right? They are, they are equal. But in this case, we, we say that the mu is shifting to the right hand side, or the process is shifting to the right hand side. So the d and the mu point are not equal. And if mu and d are not equal, then the CP is not that informative about the process quality, right? So that's why what we are doing next is we're gonna calculate four indexes, not just one, okay? In the textbook, we talk about one index, right? But here, we're gonna talk about four indexes. So uh, here are the four capability indexes. So for our side, capability indexes, there are four of them. Number one is called a process cap capability. Okay, uh, or CP. CP is calculated as USL minus LSL. You should have read this in the unconnect way. USL minus LSL divided by six sigma. Six times the standard deviation. Okay, so uh, what is that? Why do we have this equation? Because USL minus LSL is the distance from here to here. Right, how wide it is. That's that's a numerator. How wide that uh, desired spec range is, and then the six sigma is actually the distance from LVL to UVL. Right. So this equation is what we just take the distance on the top, divide that by the distance at the bottom right here, and we want that ratio to be more than one because we want the LVL and UVL to stay inside the LSL and, and USL, right? So we want the, the distance on the top to be bigger than the distance at the bottom. So desirably, this ratio should be greater than one or equal, at least equal one, right? At, at least one, desirably. Okay, uh, one, 1.2, 1.5. Right. And we are not happy if it is 0.8 or 0.9 or even lower. All right, so that's the first index that you also read that in the textbook, right? Today we learn three more so that we can deal with the mean shifting situation. What does that mean, mean by mean shifting? Let me give you one example. Uh, when you buy a new car, the car is perfectly aligned, right? When you, uh, it means that when you take your hands off of the driving wheel, the car can just go straight by itself. So we call it as a process is centered. But over time, because of the wear uh, and tears of the parts inside the car, uh, something get loose uh, a little bit, right? Then, um, then the car will veer to the left by itself or the car will veer to the right hand side by itself. So we call that as mean shifting, right? To deal with the mean shifting, we have to use the next three indexes. The first one is called the lower, I mean, the second index that we learn here is a lower uh, capability index. or CPL or lower. So it is uh, defined as we take the mu minus the LSL divided by three sigma, right? What is that? So if you look at the picture, if I project the mu to be from down here to be up there, right, and let's call that as mu, then mu minus the LSL is the distance right here, right? 
And the three sigma on the, in the denominator is the three, three sigma right here, the distance from the mu to the LVR. So actually we take that distance divided by that distance. And of course we want that ratio to be more than one because we want the LVR to stay inside the LSR, right? The LVR needs to be here. The ratio needs to be more than one. Um, so that's, that's why we use this equation to see if this LVL stay inside that LSL or not. So um, desirably, we also want this one to be, this ratio to be more than one, or at least one, desirably. That's the second index. The third index is called the upper capability. index, the CPU by right, or upper for upper equals USL minus mu divided by three sigma, right? One more time, what do we do here? We just take this distance on the top. USL minus mu is the distance right here. We divide that by the distance down here so that we can compare these two points here. Right, so we take, uh, so of course we want that to be more than one. So greater than one or equal to one desirably. Okay, so now we already have a, an index for us to look at the left hand side, another index to look at the right hand side. Uh, we would combine them so that we have a, a big picture about the whole process, right? So number four is, uh, is called the process capability index or CPK. So CPK equals the minimum between the CPL and the CPU, right? So if both CPL and CPU are greater than one, the minimum will be also greater than one. And that's desirable, right? Um, but if C either CPL or CPU or both are, great, are less than one, then the CPK will be less than one. And that's not good because one of the CPL or CPU is, is less than one, right? So desirably, we also want this to be at least one, right? So the rule of thumb is we want these indexes to be more than one or this one. And if, if something is less than one, then it's not good because we will not meet the desired specification in some way. Right. So this is the, the kind of technical background. And uh, I would like to show you the example in the slide so that we can uh, practice with this calculation. So our example is on slide 35 uh, of our module five. Let me share that with you. Just one second, I need to do something. Okay, so let me share that with you. Okay, so this is on slide 35 of our module five, right? A specification for a spatial plate used in a machine two has specification LSL of 0 0.05 and USL of 0.10 centimeters in thickness. One centimeter is a, a short distance like my little finger right here, right? Uh, it's not an inch, it is much smaller than a one inch. And then now we talk about 0 0.05 or 0 0.10 of a centimeter, right? So just imagine it's a very, a 
very small distance right there. Uh, and why do why do we have to talk about the spatial plate? Because it is even though they are very simple parts, spatial plate is just a piece of metal with so certain thickness, right? But they are very important because people will need to use a spatial plate to keep the blade, the cutting blades with the some certain distance, right? And then you use that distance to cut other uh, parts, to make other parts. So even though the spatial plates are very simple, but it's very important and very effective uh, in manufacturing. Uh, and of course, we cannot hit the same value every time. So the engineer think that uh, in this case, we allow it to vary from 0 0.05 to 0 0.10, and it doesn't affect much uh, the quality of the products, right? So we, we put those two limits up. Uh, a sample of 100 parts found the mean to be 0 0.067 and the sigma to be 0 0.011, right? This 100 parts just say that we collect enough data so that the mean, the average, and the standard deviation here are kind of reliable. Uh, they reflect the, they reflect upon the true char characteristics of the production project. Right. So again, mu and sigma are the average and standard deviation get from the data that we we uh, collect uh, over the units that we produce through the uh, through the machine or through the process. And our task is to calculate the CPU, CPL, CP, and the CBK. Right? The, the four indexes that we just mentioned earlier. So let me uh, go back to the whiteboard and we talk on this. And by the way, what we are doing next is very similar to question 25 in the homework. Uh, so later on, I will also talk about the due dates of question 23 through 25 of homework two. All right, so next we talk about the example. All right, we are still in the big topic of uh, process capability. And now we hit the example of that topic. So we talk about the spatial plate. This is module five and slide 35. All right, then remember, we want to do it visually first. We want to compare between the design and the implementation to the sketch first. So we do the two scale diagram, right? So we draw the specification limits at the top as uh, the range like this, L, S, L, U, S, L, and D, Y in the middle. And uh, they, they actually give us these values, right? The lower spec limit is 0 0.05. The upper spec limit is 0.10. And then the D here, if you calculate it, it's going to be 0 0.075. Now to calculate it, the D is what? Let me remind you, uh, the D equals LSL plus USL divided by two. So we just take 0 0.05 plus 0 0.10 divided by two. And that's how we got that 0 0.075. And right? that's a bullseye right there for the desirable value. And then uh, now we need to, so that's the design specification. And now here we need to draw the process variation. All right, we just draw a line like that first. And then the mean is 0 0.067, right? That mean will be on the left hand side D because it's only 0 0.067. So that, that value right here is smaller than that value there. So the mean is to the left hand side D, right? 
Okay, so um, now let's go to the left hand side by three sigma to find the LVL. So we go here to the LVL, uh, right? Then we cover the LVL as a follower. From the mean, we go to the left hand side by three sigma. So we take 0 0.067 minus three times 0 0.011, right? Where 0 0.011 is given by the question. Right, we just subtract by three sigma and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit that LVL. So if we do this, it's gonna be 0 0.034. Point zero three four, and I hope you see that point zero three four is to the left hand side of the LSL. Right, LSL is point zero five. This value is smaller than that, so the LVL stays to the left hand side of that LSL. Okay, and uh, by the same token, we can uh, calculate the upper variation limit. So the UVL equals mu plus three sigma. So you will take 0 0.067 plus three times 0 0.011, right? Then we have, if you calculate it, it's gonna be 0 0.10. So 0 0.10 is right here, right underneath the USL. So the, in this case, the USL and the UVL actually uh, perfectly line up, right? Okay, so we have um, so we have the specs, we have the variation, and now let's do the comparison between the two. Um, please, uh, I hope you, you see it right away that there's a bad thing. If you look at the mean, the average, uh, the process average is right here where we, we want it to hit that bullseye on average, right? So it's not good because on average, we we say that we do not meet the bullseye. The mean and the D values are two uh, are different. So we say that on average, the process doesn't meet the bullseye, doesn't hit the bullseye, right? Uh, that's the first bad thing about the process. The second uh, bad thing that we see here is the UVL sticks outside of the LSL. The UVL is supposed to be inside here so that we meet the lower spec limit. But if it sticks out like this, then many units will be defective, right? How to show the defective in this picture? If you, uh, if you project the LSL down to be that point, then all the outliers are defective. But then even the non the non outliers, they stay under they stay inside the LVL. They are also defective because at the end they are compared with the LSL and the, they are all all of these units are too thin. Right? We talk about the spatial plate. These units are, are too thin, so they will be defective. Right? Not only inside, but also the not only the outliers. Normally the outliers are defective, but then even inside the LVL, we also see defective items, right? On the right hand side, that's a good uh, that that's a good feature about this picture. On the right hand side, the UVL equals the USL, so it means that we only have these as being defective. They are the outliers. They are the defective uh, unit, right? And inside, from here to here, they are all meeting the upper spec limit. So we can say that most of the products meet the the upper spec limit. Right? Nearly all of the products actually meet the upper spec limit. But many units will be defective because they do not meet the lower spec limit. So in overall the process is not doing good relative to the design specification. With this, right, we're gonna produce a lot of defective units. 
let me uh, also show the defective units uh, here. These are defective. They play outside of the specifications and they are defective. Right. Okay, so we do it as a visual sketch for us to have the intuition about what is going on with our process, right? But at the end of the day, we need to come up with some specific numbers so that things are, are definitive. It's not ambiguous. All right, because vi visual judgment is notoriously unreliable, right? Every every person will have his or her own uh, vi visual judgment, so uh, it's not reliable. Instead, we we're going to calculate the four indexes that we uh, we mentioned earlier. All right, so the first index, remember, it is a CP, right? CP equals USL minus LSL divided by six sigma, or six times the sigma. So let's uh, put the numbers in. That's uh, 0.10 right here minus uh, 0 0.05 and divided by six times 0 0.011. Right. All of these, again, are given by the question. So uh, it's not a big deal. We just plug them in and then we calculate the CP. And in this case, it is uh, 0.75, right? We want this value to be more than one, but it is less than one, so it's not good. Um, the process is not centered. So if, if the process is centered, we can say a lot by looking at that 0.75. But because the process is not centered, we cannot say a whole lot. Uh, we can say the following. First of all, that value is less than 1.0. And second, it means that the units vary more than they are allowed. Right. You allow the units to vary this much, but they 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 vary more than that. So that's not good, right? <clears throat> uh, or we say that the, the produced units are not consistent with one another. Right. They are quite different intuitively. So uh, not consistent is is not good. In manufacturing, we want the units to be kind of close with each other, right? All right, so that's the, the first index that we uh, can do uh, because the, the process is not centered. We cannot say more about the CP. Now, let's look at the lower variation uh, side of the distribution, right? Then we can call it the CPL. So it is mu minus the LV. LSL divided by three sigma. When you do this at home for question 25, I hope you can relate between our calculation here and the picture that we did earlier. The calculations are just numerical version of the picture that we have. <clears throat> Sorry, so we, we take 0 0.067 minus the 0 0.05, right, and then Divide the whole thing by point uh, or three times point zero one one, right? Uh, if we calculate this, it's going to be point fifty two. This value is way more than sorry, way less than one point out. We want it to be it to be at least one, but not only it is less than one, but it is way less than one, right? So it means that the lower variation limit is way below the USL. So our interpretation is the following. This is a quick interpretation. Uh, cross the process does not meet the lower spec limit. 
right? It has to be above the spike limit, but right? the lower variation limit is below the low the lower spike limit. So in general, the process does not meet the lower spike limit. Or in more details, you would say many units should be defective because they are uh, too too thin, right? Because we talk about the spacer plate here. All right, so that's the second index. And the third index is for us to look at the right hand side. So we will take the upper spec limit minus mu divided by three sigma. It means that we take 0.10 minus 0 0.067 divided by three times 0 0.011, right? And then this value, if you calculate it, uh, you know what is going to be 1.0. That's why earlier when we uh, look at the picture, it's not a coincidence that the LVL stay exactly under the USL, right? Because we calculation, we see that it's not random, All right? So with uh, so this 1.00 uh, means that at least we have something equal to one, right? Equal one, so greater than one. But at least we have something equal one. So it is good, right? Uh, of course, the higher is the better. But at least we, we meet the minimum. So in this case, right, we can say that the process meet the upper spec limit. Or in more details, you can say that many units or nearly all of the units will meet the upper spec limit. Right? So that's the interpretation. And finally, now we can do the combination between the two indexes by the CPK. The CPK is a minimum between the CBL and the CBU. So in this case, we, we need to find a smaller value between 0.52 and 1.00, right? It's just the smaller between the two values. And we get it to be 0.52. And this 0.52 is way less than 1.0. Right? It's not good. So remember, if both of the CPR and CPU are greater than one, then the CPK will be greater than one. But in this case, we find the CPK to be 0.52. It must be that, it must be that either CPL or CPK is less than one, right? So that's why CPK is the most watched index in, in uh, engineering, generically, okay? Uh, because it captures both the lower and the upper variation. But you know what, sometimes uh, sometime they, uh, uh, sometime they look at the CPL more, the CPU, CPU more because they are more uh, important for the process. All right, so in this case, we just say as the, the process doesn't meet the design specification. Okay, so um, with that, we're done with this question. And uh, you will do something very similar to this in question 25 of your homework. So we are short on time. Uh, let me talk about the, uh, the exam results right away. You know what? Um, our exam happened last uh, Wednesday, right? And the high score among all of you is 96 points out of 100 points. The average is 69.7. Virtually, it is 70 points out of 100, right? That's the average. The maximum is 96, the average is 70. And the median, the median is a value stay right between uh, in, in the middle of the class, right? Half of the class will be more than, me, than the median and half of the class will be below the median. So our class median is 78. Think about it, it's a very high median score here, right? 
So as a group, our class doing uh, doing uh, good. Uh, I would say it is uh, even uh, slightly better than my face-to-face -face classes. So that's a good thing. Uh, of course, among uh, the students here, some of you are doing uh, very well, and uh, some of you did it uh, not very well, right? So that variation among the students. Uh, but you know what? Don't worry too much. I would like to give you a redo chance. So if you redo the exam, and I will post it very soon on Canvas today, um, if you redo the exam, you will have five more points, no matter what you already have earlier, okay? If you redo the exam, you have five more points. Uh, that's a fixed number of points right there. So the second chance here is for you to learn, uh, learn uh, better, right? Uh, you have another chance to learn what you, uh, we are supposed to learn in our class. Um, if you have a low scores, then don't worry too much. The, the redo is for you to show me that you already learn and understand the materials, right? And that's very important for me, the past student through my class. Um, so it's, it's a good opportunity for you to learn, but also it's a good opportunity for you to demonstrate that you already um, understand the material. And, and that's good for me to, uh, to consider. Right. Okay, so that's about the midterm. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have time, so I have to move on right away. There's another announcement that um, the remaining three questions of the homework will be due next Monday. So today we cover question 25, and mm -hmm. in the remaining time I will cover question 23. That question is short and easy. It should, it should not be a big deal. And on Wednesday we cover question 24. Question 24 is another, is, is another big topic. So on Wednesday, we cover it and you should be ready for uh, the homework uh, due by Monday, right? <clears throat> um, I will make all of these announcements online so that on, on Canvas so that everybody will be on the same page. All right, um, sorry, I, I need to move on to the next uh, topic right away. Uh, this topic is about the defect probability, and that's for question 23. I, I believe that you already did it on connect. It should not be a big deal. All right, so this is a, for the defect probability or DP. Uh, we're gonna use the same example as before because normally this is in the manufacturing Context. Uh, so we use the same numbers in the earlier example, which is the spacer plate. Uh, example on module five, slide 35. Right. So how to calculate the defect probability? First of all, we, uh, we draw the distribution as a follow. So here it is a thickness of the unit of the space of plates. Um, they are they they tend to follow the normal distribution, right? So we draw that symmetric curve. And then uh, in the middle we have the mean mu. In this case it is given to be 0 0.067 by the question by, by the example, right? And then we cut the left tail by the lower spec limit. Only the units be above the spec limit to be uh, to be good, right? And the units also have to be below the upper spec limit. So we cut the distribution at two points uh, so that we cut the two tails out. Uh, okay, so uh, all the units down here will be defective all the units are up here will be defective, right? So our task is to calculate this probability uh, being too thin. Right? We need to calculate the probability uh, or the area under the curve, right? That triangle right there, we need to find that, uh, the area or the probability of that triangle. And then on the right hand side, we have to find the probability 
uh, being too thick. Right, the area of the triangle on the right hand side. And then we add them up together, then we have the probability of being infected, right? Conceptually, it's, it's very easy. So that's why the calculation itself is also kind of straightforward. So let me show you how to do the calculation. Uh, I will not have time to show everything. So I, let me show you the conceptual steps and then I'll fill in the details later uh, and post that as a class note. So first of all, the probability of uh, being too thin, right? Then uh, if you recall what you read in uh, connect, then it's gonna be norm dot this, uh, the LSL, and then put in the mu, put in the sigma, all of these are given by the question and comma one at the end. The comma one to say that Excel, please help us to find the area under the code, right? That's what the number one is for. So you don't have to worry too much about it, okay? And on the right hand side, the equation goes as probability of being too thick will be one minus the norm dot this, and then we have the L, S, L, mu, sigma, comma one. The one minus, because we talk about the right tail. So we have to find something on the left hand side first and then do one minus so that we have the right tail, right? Uh, so that's the, the equation to find the right tail. And uh, at the end, we can find the probability of being defective. or the defect probability, or DP, as a sum between being too thin and being too thick, right? So after we find the, the DP or the defect probability, then we can also easily calculate the PPM. Remember, the PPM is the parts per million. So we just, uh, or parts per million. It's just the defect probability times with, with 1 million. We did this under the Six Sigma topic, right? So it's not a big deal. And finally, uh, again, later on, I will fill in all of the details here, all the numbers here so that, uh, you know how to do this for question 25, uh, 23. And we can uh, we can calculate the sigma level and make a sketch up out of it, right? So the sigma level is norm dot s dot inverse one minus the DP, the defect probability, and then add with 1.5 uh, at the end, right? And then, the, and then we can make a sketch out of this. So um, let me give you one example here. For example, to calculate the P probability of being too thin, we do that as norm dot this. And then the L is, L is 0 0.05, right, given by the question. Mu is 0 0.067, then 0 0.011, right? And then comma one at the end. Then the answer would be, uh, let me do it quick and then we end our class. Very quick. This value is 0 0.06112, right? And then we can do more and more and then we have all the detail numbers. Okay, so I would like to thank you all for joining me today and uh, I would like to see you back on Thursday. I mean on Wednesday so that we can cover another topic for question 24. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you for joining me and uh, have a great rest of your day.